We have 18 months to develop our so. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another insightful episode of my educational series. My guest this week is a global CEO, board chair, Fortune 500 executive, retail innovator, and author. I am honored to be welcoming Mr. George Minakakis, who is also the CEO and founder of Inception Retail Group, Inc., a consulting firm that helps small and mid-sized retailers to rebuild and innovate their market position. He has over 35 years of experience in the retail, restaurant, and healthcare sectors. Mr. Minakakis has held senior executive positions at Luxotica, the world's largest eyewear company, where he served as the country general manager for Canada and the Greater China, and at PepsiCo, where he was the franchise business director. He's currently a board chair at Milton Hydro Distribution, Inc., a for-profit organization owned by the municipality of Milton, Ontario. And he is also the author of two books on retail leadership and relevance. Along with his very rich and diverse professional journey, Mr. Minakakis is a very strong advocate of helping retail organizations and leaders to stay relevant and competitive in a fast-changing and disruptive environment. So, what are you going to actually see in this interview? This interview is basically Mr. Minakakis' blueprint of how he strategizes, how he makes executive decisions, how he was able to lead international teams to excellence and sustainability, how he launched and sustained his own consulting firm, you are going to gain insights from a senior leader on overcoming adversity, structuring retail exit strategies, advising private equity and private businesses on retail strategies and operations. Mr. Minakakis, I want to sincerely thank you for allocating your very, very limited and valuable time to talk to me, reflect upon your journey, share your expertise, your thoughts, so that the young generation of aspiring entrepreneurs can come into the industry ready to make more educated decisions. Σα ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για το χρόνο σα και την προσβασιμότητά σα, κύριε Μινακάκη. Σημαίνει πολλά. That was a Greek greeting to Mr. Μινακάκη because he has roots in Greece. Enjoy the interview. I will be very upfront with you. I spent a lot of time in the library when I was young. Well, I grew up in an era of Western movies and spy movies. You know, I mean, that was the world yes. I grew up in. Well, I watched my dad, you know, lose his job, get a new job. And by the time I was eight or nine years old, I knew enough and said, boy, you know, I understood a little bit about economics, right? I was putting it, I was piecing it together in my head. And at nine, at nine yes. The best thing, having no plan or a rough plan is the best plan. Yes, but you enjoy life, you experience it, right? Absolutely. But, But you're young enough, you know, you're young enough at that point um, that you can, you know you're going to, you have the energy level to enjoy it and learn at the same time. <clears throat> I, um, like I said, I started, you know, I, I, my parents are immigrants, right, mm -hmm. from Sparta, right, of the Sparta. Okay. And so both of them, right? And my father was a soldier and the Spartan life is in him, right? You know, I mean, there's fighter, 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 right? But um, when you grow up, in it, when, you, when you're the son of immigrants and the firstborn, you know, you are the English translator, <laughs> right? Because your <laughs> yeah, parents yeah. are, they're get, they get the English language, but, you know, when you're seven, eight years old, what does this mean? What, what is that word? <laughs> you know, so you, you become an adult very, very quickly. Yeah. You know, I mean, so um, so that shaped me, George. Right. I mean, it really shaped me. But I will be very upfront with you. I spent a lot of time in the library when I was young um, and reading about leadership books uh, on leadership. And it was American, you know, American and Canadian leadership. Right. And, and different ones. And, you know, I grew up in an era 
of Western movies and spy movies. You know, I mean, that was the world yes. I grew up in. And uh, that was Americana, Canadiana, you know, and you know, this is what you lived in, right? Now, I have, I have lived in Canada, but I've also lived in the U.S. as well, right? So I have a blend of both. Um, and so I, I can comfortably speak to both, you know, in terms of culturally really ingrained in me. And I watched my dad work, right? My mother had a job. My father had a job. I was the eldest. I had to, I had a little brother by the time I was seven, right? I had to keep an eye on him as well, you know? So, I mean, you, if you, as a Greek, you understand the culture. I fully understand. Yes. <laughs> right. So yeah. um, a lot of people don't, but so that was my life. And, you know, I watched my dad, you know, lose his job, get a new job. And by the time I was eight or nine years old, I knew enough and said, boy, you know, I understood a little bit about economics, right? I was putting it, I was piecing it together in my head. And at nine. at nine, yes. I knew how, I, mean, I knew the world. I said, you know, if, if you had enough money and you could do these things, all people really, if you could make enough money doing, providing transportation, providing food, providing housing. I had that in my head back then. So it was already formulating that I understood the needs of consumers, but I never really attached it to anything other than, you know, I saw my parents' hardship, right? But I recognized that it wasn't my parents' hardship, any, I, I alone, it was everybody's hardship, right? Because I grew up in the 60s and I'm, I lived amongst Greeks, Italians, Germans, right? So, I mean, it was a very, very culturally mixed part of, of Montreal. And I saw a lot of things. And look, I used to make money as a kid, right? I would knock on people's doors, the elderly people, and ask them if I could take out their garbage. And they would pay, they would give me a quarter, which is a quarter of a dollar, which is, you know, I mean, today it's nothing. But back then, it could almost buy you a pack of smokes. You know, if you smoked, right? I don't. But, um, but that's just kind of uh, the world I was in. And it shaped me. And then my parents moved. They started their own business um, and they scraped to put it together and, you know, and we all had to work in it again, Greek family, you know what it's like, right? Oh, yes. Everybody's engaged in it. Mm -hmm. That started to shape me as well, right? And um, I didn't know if I wanted to go to university. By the time I was 17, I didn't know if I wanted to go to university. I, I wanted to get into business. I was eager to start life and, and to go after it. I already have every morning. Um, from the time I can remember, you know, my parents started their business when I was about 12. Um, there's a newspaper here in Canada called the Globe and Mail. Mm -hmm. And the Globe and Mail has been in circulation many, many, many years. And they have a business section called the Report on Business. I've been reading that since then, right? Because the, the newspaper guy would deliver the newspaper to the restaurant yeah. and I would read it. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I knew how the world was changing and I saw business firsthand understood what my father was trying to do, um, and it shaped me. Now, I have to tell you, so my father, when I was 16, my father thought I was lazy, right? And he wanted me, because I was like, girls were interesting, you know, and, and uh, you know, I wanted to go out and hang around with at, on the beaches, right? And he thought I was lazy. So he had bought this building, and he, he had one restaurant in one location, and he was going to relocate it, and he says, I got, I got six months left on this lease. I'm going to turn it into an ice cream parlor. What do you think? I said, oh, it's a great idea, Dad. I said, who's going to work? He goes, you are. <laughs> I am? He goes, yes, this is your summer job. And I was shocked, <laughs> right? Because yeah, it, and it was, and I was, you know, the first, first few weeks, it was like, um, you know, profits were not there because I was eating most of it and drinking most of it. <laughs> And my friends were coming in to visit me, you know, and so then I finally decided, okay, I better make money because he's not going to be happy with me. Mm -hmm. And I started making money doing that. Um, but that that kind of shaped my mind then to I needed a better ed a better education. But I won't lie to you. By the time I was 19 years old, I wanted to start a business, and I went to see the bank manager. The bank manager happened to be a friend of my father's, and and I lived in a small town. The town. Mm -hmm. Uh, was maybe 10,000 people at the time. Now it's 160,000 people. So the bank manager went and saw my father and he goes, you have to send this guy to university. He's, he cannot waste his life 
not with doing this without an education. He's too smart not to do it with an education. He needs it, right? But he's smart and he has a, he's aggressive. Um, and my father started pushing me. He goes, okay, you either become a mechanic or you go get a university education. You have a choice, but you got to do something. Now, he said mechanic because when I was in high school, I took, I took machine shop and I took auto mechanics because I loved cars, right? But I had no desire to fit repair cars. He just figured that's what your future is going to be if you don't do something. Um, I decided to go to university. And, um, and from there, it started to shape me. My first job, and that, that kind of formulated where I ended up. Right. But I didn't have any, George, I didn't ant anticipate going into the consumer sector again. Right. Having grown up in it, I didn't anticipate doing that. I anticipated doing different things, but it drew me into it because I un already understood it. But to be honest, um, when I got out of university, I started a company called Data Aid Personnel with my wife. So I was 23, 24 years old. And all we did was recruiting for um, for programmers, right? Programmers were high demand by then, right? Uh, in the early 80s, and you couldn't get enough of them. So we started up a personnel agency. The first day I opened it up, I had advertised. I must have had 500 people lined up outside to give me their resume, right? Were you always like reading the market? Were you perspicacious enough to read the market? Because I understand you may not like something, but you love business, so you go where business is. That's what I get from you. Yes, yes, okay. exactly. And um, but in any event, uh, that did okay. But then I left that. I ended up at PepsiCo uh, mm -hmm. in the consumer side. You know, my career took off. Um, I think by the time I was 34, I was the director of uh, business development, and that really, you know, having worked you know, for family business and what it takes to succeed on a grassroots level, um, starting my own business um, and doing other things, that really shaped me again, right? And prepared me for that role. Um, and I started to formulate my own theories around what, what a successful franchise would look like and marketplaces. Now, I, I'm gonna tell you something interesting. I had a very, very hard marketplace. My marketplace was Hawaii and Guam. That was how hard it was, you know. So they really treated me very, very well. And um, uh, my every time I go there, I would I would go there for two weeks at a time. And my wife wanted to know if I was coming back. Um, but I, I've had a I've had a very I'm very fortunate that I had good mentors uh, mm -hmm. and good opportunities thrown at me. But I have to admit, you don't opportunities don't come to you. You have to create them, and you have to be willing to raise your hand and say, "I'm going to take it and risk." Right. There's just so much um, lack of risk today uh, amongst people, you know, who are working in a career or even who are those who want to start a business. You know, I, I really don't understand somebody who wants to start a business and doesn't want risk. That makes no sense. To me. It's 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 scary. I, I think it makes sense. It's scary for people. It's scary for me. And I'm not at your level. Nowhere, nowhere near close to your level. It's scary when you are going somewhere and you've never been or you. If you don't have someone to lead you, at least to an extent, you're like, okay, what am I doing? It may not work. Who am I to do it? Why? Yeah. All these questions. We, we have, we doubt ourselves. We shouldn't be though. So, and then I ended up at Luxottica um, in 1994. And uh, from there, it was, I had this thing in my mind. I hope I'm answering all your questions. I had this thing in my mind that, uh, and I learned this at Pepsi, if you don't, move up every two years at Pepsi, you're being left behind, you're not doing well, okay? So I had to set in my mind that I had to work very hard so that every two years I actually increased in responsibilities or I got a new title or took on a new role somewhere. And because of I had that mindset, um, my career just was nonstop. I always pushed for more and asked for more. So. It got to the point with Luxottica by 1999, 98, 99, I was running four retail divisions in Canada. And, um, and then I ended up uh, in 2006, I ended up in China, um, running, expanding lens crafters in China uh, for three and a half years, came back, 
Um, and so the business development side of me was with me all the time, right? It's always so developing. We're seeking like expand, 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 move on. Develop don't have, one, don't have both feet in one location, just expand. Develop all markets, make them profitable, find the niche in the market, have the right people, hire, surround yourself with the right people, the smartest people. One thing I was never afraid to hire people smarter than me, right? And that you, you just have to. Um, and but the great part about it was that I'm not stupid, so um, I could challenge them in return because the value I gave them was experience they didn't have, right? But they would come back with incredible strategies and opportunities that we continued to evolve and grow the marketplaces. So it it paid for it paid for me to be able to do all that. Um, but the business development side was, you know, where is the next opportunity? What a bit, what other business can we buy? And I'll tell you, it was, it was not uncommon for me here in Canada, for example, <clears throat> when, I, when I worked for Luxottica before China, I would go into a mall, somebody with the develop, the development people would say to me, hey, boss, we go see this mall and tell us if you're okay with opening a store here. So I go to the mall and uh, I noticed there's a competitor there. And of course, George, we're Greek, right? I mean, we're not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, I saw the competitor there and I went inside, introduced myself and said, hey, you know what? My name is George Minakakis and this is my role. And we're about to open a store down the hall. And I see <laughs> you've got a great business. You know, would you consider selling your business to me? And he'd go, why? And I said, well, because if I open up, we're going to end up, I wouldn't insult them. I said, we're going to split hairs, yeah. right? Truth was, we were going to take the market share. Yes, yeah, that, that's the truth. <laughs> right? And what the way it worked, all, most of the time it worked out was that, uh, not all the time, most of the time, but it, it cost us less to buy the store than it was to build the store. That's business strategy, like 101. That's, it's genius, it's genius. There's no other way to put it. So we so we grew and, uh, you know, I had uh, great opportunities um, when I returned from China. I ended up in the U.S. for a while, came back to Canada for a couple of years. They were restructuring the company. Um, I could have stayed, but they were I would have ended up with some lesser roles. And I said, you know what, guys, it's been a great 20 years. Time for me to go. And and it was amicable because we. I don't want this written anywhere, George, but basically I was financially in a place that I didn't have to worry. Thank God. Okay. So a poor Greek kid from Montreal did well. Um, and I, my, I had never taken a very long vacation with my wife, but after retirement, I said, let's go. Where are we going? We're going on a long, a long trip. And I said, I don't know where we're going to end up, but we're going to take, so we ended up in a cruise in Australia. I've been to Australia a couple of times already on business and she had never been there. So we were taking a cruise to Australia. Um, and then I said, you know what? We're going to stay a little longer. So we stayed four or five days in Sydney and then we were, we had to fly to Hong Kong. I said, you know what? Call I'm going to call the uh, travel agent. We're going to stay another four or five days here. Cause she loved Hong Kong. I love Hong, Hong Kong as well. And, uh, met up with a few old friends that I had and vacation turned out to be 35 days. <laughs> That's nice. That's the best thing. Having no plan or a rough plan is the best plan. Yes, but you enjoy life. You experience it, right? Absolutely. But, but you're young enough, you know, you're young enough at that point um, that you can, you know, you're going to, you have the energy level of, of, to enjoy it and learn at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and when I came back, no word of a lie, I'm, I'm a couple of days later, I'm jet lagged. I'm in my car driving back from Toronto and, I get a phone call in my car. Uh, I'll tell you two funny stories though. So the first one is the, the, the guy calls me up. He goes, hey, uh, we met at this meeting and I don't know if you, his name is Sam. And he goes, I don't know if you remember me, but I work for, I work for, for invest, investment capital firm. And uh, I think it was called Capital Canada. I can't remember the name, but he left them. And he goes, have you ever thought about owning this company? I said, yeah, sure. If you got $150 million to lend me, I'd love to own that company. And he goes, I know ABC. I, I read about the ABC. Uh, no, this oh, is no. no, I can't tell you. Can't tell you who it was. 
Understandable. So, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to buy the company from him, and people are telling him, like, George is the son you never had. You need to sell him this company so that you can your legacy continues. Never. They you know what I put them after the other people. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. Ever. You know, it's just the way he is. So, but that opened up the door to a lot of other opportunities. And before I knew it, um, I ended up um, becoming a CEO, par CEO partner with private equity firms. So half a dozen or so would call me now and then and say, look, we got, we're looking at this portfolio. We want to get into this sector, you know, consumer facing businesses, but they weren't all retail. They were healthcare. They were, you know, cosmetics, you know, they were, they weren't, they weren't always retail. And they were exciting. You know, I mean, I had the opportunity if I wanted to invest in them. And and so that was the journey. That's been the journey. It opened up a lot of doors. Um, I ended up writing one book and then a second book and a second book came along and then the third book came along, you know. But if you had said to me, George, did you ever think about writing books? No, I never would have thought about it. You know, not once. Right. It just so happens that I had the time and the desire to do it. Um, but this journey has been amazing. Right. Because I've never stopped learning and something you don't know because I, don't, I have not articulated it. And maybe you saw it. I don't know. But I ran for political office a few weeks ago and I lost, obviously. Right. But um, the odds, everybody was telling me, like, the, people are knocking on the door. You're amazing. We want to vote for you. So people come out and say to me, vote for you. The problem is there's so much apathy in voting in Canada. Right. The number of voters who came out to vote was 28.9%. It was horrible. Oh, that's, bad. Oh, that's bad. Right? But when yeah. you have low ter voter turnout, and this is a different subject, but when you have low, low voter turnout, the probability for manipulation, we'll call it manipulation, it really isn't, to manipulate the vote count because the low vote is so low, right? You could go to the Italian community and say, hey, you got to vote for, for, for Giuseppe, right? And if you vote for Giuseppe, we're going to have our own person in. And that's what happens, right? So they beat you by a thousand votes because they went to the Italian community or the Catholic community. You know, that, that's what, how it happened when you have low voter, voter turnout. So, but I learned something, right? And I told my wife, I said, you know, regardless if I went, I, I said, I may do it again because I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, but I learned something very valuable, a reminder, a reminder of, what it takes to win you know and the fact that you have to knock on doors george right and sell yourself right yes. your values your principles uh, and you're selling yourself and they would say to me you know you're competing against this person i said no i'm not i am here to earn your trust that i am the right candidate and people were really impressed by that right again it wasn't enough to win because I'm running against an incumbent, which is really hard to win against, right? No, but, but you are true to yourself. And I believe this is very important for someone in politics because people like you, they, they don't exist. They don't exist, they really do not. And you have moral values and this is gold for people who actually need someone to set them free. Yeah. Because we're not, we're not free. So I'd say to of course try again and it's up to you to decide but stay true to yourself, and I'm sure you will, regardless of what I'm going to say or not, because this is who you are, and it's admirable of you. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. So, you know, I, I now I got I was inspired by what I did, and I said to my wife, "Look, Monica, I now know what it is I have to do." And she goes, "What are you talking about?" I said, "I forgot something very important." And it's the passion to win. Mm -hmm. And you you have that when you're young, George. You have it inside of you. Yes. And I describe it as this. You get up in the morning and you have the feeling inside of you that you know you can grab the world by the tail. Right? And it, you're not letting go. Okay? Yes. I lost that. Even though I had a great career, right? I lost a little bit of that during my career because... What careers do is they form you and they shape you and they discipline you and they take you apart and they rebuild you, right? And you forget who you were. And I said to Monica, 
I know now who I was. I remember this person, right? Because he was never going to let go. He wasn't going to let the world do tell him what to do. So now I said, now I've got it back. And I said, even though I didn't succeed, I will never forget what it takes to win again. And so um, here I am, right? Now, I, I can't tell you what I'm doing. I will tell you that, um, yes, it's still involved in the consulting world. Uh, I do a lot of speeches to, I mean, just did one for the Philippine Retail Association. Um, so I do talk to groups and some of them are weird. Uh, you know, I mean, I did one, I did one presentation to a group of, let's just call them finance people who know nothing about the consumer sector. I did another presentation to another group and I was talking about the metaverse briefly. I'm not an expert at it. Um, briefly. And a couple of people just raised their hand and said, can you tell us what the metaverse is? And I thought, okay, there's a problem. There. It's <laughs> yeah, problem. Yes. Yes. Right. And it's, but these people are in their forties. That's a real problem. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So I, I, I have a plan of what else, what it is I want to do next. Um, but w running and losing was the most important thing I did to revitalize myself again. Right. And it was, it was, it was an important gift. It cost money, but it was an important gift. Um, so I, I will tell, I want to tell you the second funny story because I was driving to a private equity firm. And I, I don't want to forget this. I was driving to a private equity firm. Do you remember um, when Twitter came out, when it went public? Yeah. So there was a mistake in the stock market called with, some people were investing in a company called Tweeter. They thought that Tweeter was Twitter. Now, about five or six years before that, because I was in China at the time, <clears throat> um, Somebody called me up and says, oh, George, this company's going, you know, the company's restructuring. You should buy, you know, buy a share. Look at the stock price. It was like, you know, a, a, a one one hundredth of a penny. And I said, I'll give you a thousand dollars. I'm not putting in a penny more into this. Right. And then I saw the stock dive even more. And I hung on to it, George. I hung on to it so I could remind myself never to do anything stupid again to help a friend. All right. Because he was a broker. So I left it there. I'm driving in my car heading to Toronto to meet with the bankers and I hear on the radio I'm listening to CNBC mm -hmm. right the the US business broadcasting and business network and they're saying oh there's a lot of confusion in the market today you know everybody's anticipating the uh, launch of Twitter and they think it's Twitter right and the stock price of Twitter has really gone up right so call my wife up because she knows how to use my web account I said, Monica get on my account she goes, well, I got friends here. I said, forget your friends. Go into my account. <laughs> do follow. She just goes, she goes, what do you want me to do? I said, you know that stupid tweeter? She goes, yes, sell. Just hit sell on it. She goes, okay, done. I said, and now keep in mind, my $1,000 became like $10. It was nothing, right? I said, how much money did I make? She goes, $17,000. Okay, now it's not, it's not a fortune, all right? It's not a no, fortune, but, but it's, redemp it's redemption. <laughs> it's redemption, exactly. So, you know, there's a little bit of luck in life too, George. That's what I wanted to share. I'm sharing that with you. Is that There happens to be a little bit of luck in life. And not just having the world by the tail, it's believing in yourself that success follows you and that you can make. And I had a good friend of mine. His name is Robert Hope. Uh, but he went by the name of Bob Hope. So the old entertainer, I'm not sure if you're even familiar mm -hmm. with him. Yes. Um, but Bob used to tell me, he goes, George, never forget you make your own luck. Very important. Would I be right to say that uh, luck is what preparation meets opportunity? See that again? Would I be right to say that luck is what preparation meets opportunity? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, you have to replace uh, risk in that equation with excitement, you know, and eagerness. Yes. yes. So your advice and your stories are gold for people like me who want to elevate in life. 
uh, I would like one day to own my own company just because I want to be free. I want to make my own my own life and be be free. So, how would you advise a young man like me who wants to to do this? Because there's people out there who don't have this business intuition like you, but they have the willingness and they're willing to put in the hard work. What values and skills do they have to build on? What people do they need to uh, surround them with to play this game? So you, you need okay. So I'll tell you a little secret. Some secrets. Mm -hmm. Every year on January the first, I want you to write down your goals for the year. Every year, write it down. Your physical, your mental, your your financial goals. I'll there you go. Now. See you. Every year, George, every year on that day, write them out and stick to them and look them up and know them. Right. And, and be specific about those goals. You know, don't just say I want to be the CEO. Just say, how am I going? To, what, what are you going to do to earn that? Right. And how are you going to get there? And that me and that's an important part of, of, of your own journey to set the stage for the future. Right now, I don't know what it is you want to be, who you want to be. And I will tell you, I didn't know what I wanted to be. You know, a lot of this stuff was accidental. Right. I mean, I I knew I wanted to climb a ladder. I've always knew, known that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the willingness to take on the risks that everybody else doesn't want to. Right. And what risks are we talking about? Taking on those jobs. Right. That nobody else wants to. My wife said to me. Uh, this is May 2005, okay? I'm in the front yard, I'm planting a tree, mm -hmm. and my wife says, it's Italy, they want to talk to you, right? Of course, it's the CEO, and he's, Giorgio, how are you? You know, and uh, so they said to me, we have a job for you, we need you. you. You're the only person that can do this. We want you to go to China. Now, a year before, I passed up Australia. I passed on it. Because I thought, eh, it's more of the same. It really isn't going to be that different. And I'm going to uproot my family and move them all the way there. It didn't make any sense to me. But my wife says to me, she, when I told my wife, she goes, this is the one. You have to take this one. This is the one that is going to define you. Because no one else will do this, this kind of work. Right? And so it was. And she was right. Because... It's volumes for a supportive wife. And they need one by her side. Six volumes. George, the other part of the the other part of the secret is having the right partner in life. That's that's gold. Yes. Yes. You know, and they need to be understanding. You need to be understanding. You know, I mean, there's lots of time. My kids are older now. I have two grandsons as well. Um, really and, congratulations. Thank you. And, you know, the interesting part about it is that I keep saying to my wife, you know, I don't I don't know if I was a good enough father. I was I don't remember everything. She goes, you were there just you were there. You were there mentally, but, you know, you, know, you were there physically, but you weren't there mentally. You know, you were there. You were, you were at work, but you were you're physically at every event that what the kids were doing. But, you know, but I look at my kids right now and my kids are grown up properly. Right. None of them have done anything embarrassing. None of them are in prison. <laughs> you know, so it's all good. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, and I joke with them. They're adults. Um, but they, too, understand what it takes to win now. Right. My youngest one just got married. My middle, my, my daughter's married. She has two little boys. My middle guy's not married, not in a hurry. Uh, the youngest one got married. Uh, to a beautiful girl, and they were in Amsterdam just a few weeks ago for their honeymoon. And when he heard that I lost um, the election, you know, so this is the kind of the, uh, you know, the the foot fingerprints you leave behind, right? He goes, Dad, I know you might feel bad about this. He goes, but I want you to know, you taught your kids something very valuable by doing this. You know, and so you feel good about it, right? When your kid, when your children say that to you. Right. It, mean, it means you've left a good impression. Behind. Right. So and it's and George, it really is about what do you and I leave behind for the next generation? Exactly. 
legacy. legacy. And the most important thing that I, I have this as like a huge goal of me is a good partner and kids. I can go after all the money in the world. I'm not going to be, become happy without any kids. So, no. My mother so, used to say that. My mother used to say to me that you, uh, I would say to her, you know, mom, look at this guy. He's got, he's worth millions. She goes, yeah, but he's not happy. I said, well, why, why is he not happy? Because he has no children. How could he be happy? He has nothing. He has no, no one to share it with. And I said, well, he has friends. She goes, no, George, it's not the same. When you're sharing it with your children, you're bringing them up and you're making their lives better. Because he's not sharing his money with his friends. And I thought, eh, you know what, you're right. It's different. What, yeah, what, what can I say? You are a role model for the younger generation. And this article is going to be extremely insightful. And apart from a very well-oriented professional, you're an extremely well-oriented individual. That's critical. Because people like you, they, they are scarce. So it's refreshing for me to hear as well. And I, it's an honor and a privilege to talk to you. Really, truthfully. So, as we said, I will be extremely professional uh, towards you. I'll send everything to you before I upload it so that you can assess it. I also, I make small promo videos to promote the articles. Would you mind if I have you uh, in small clips, just talking for brief seconds on these promo videos? If you don't want to, it's fine. On the what, sorry? On, on brief so, seconds? Yeah, on... I, I make small promotional videos to promote the article. Would you mind if I have maybe two or three second clip of you talking not not specifically about business but maybe a, a, a joke we've had sure yeah, so. yeah just let me know what you're going to do and that'd be fine. i will send it over to you before i upload it as well you don't have to worry that's fine sure absolutely it's good make sure i look good george i mean per persona is everything right <laughs> <laughs> you have a, a lot of energy that, that's what i get from you you're a very energetic person i know people in their like 20s who are less energetic than you. It's extremely nice to see a person like you. It's very refreshing for me because you're the person I aspire to be every single day. So I'll keep following you. I'm sure you're gonna, you're not done yet. I wish you good luck with the next elections because I'm sure you will tackle this task again. And having in mind your perspicacity and your sheer indefatigability, <laughs> I'm sure you will become successful. So, Thank you again for doing this. It's truthfully a privilege to see you. Okay. Great. Likewise. Thank you very much. And good luck no to you. Thank you. Thank you. All Have right. a beautiful day. Yeah.